Welcome to our first lecture for the summer semester of 2020. My name is Bill Brooks and I will be your instructor for this course. This is obviously an online course, so all activities will take place through our D2L site. Please make sure you keep up to date with all the materials and news as they are posted. I recommend you enable notifications so that you do not miss anything. I have provided instructions on how to do that in the first posting on your news feed. You will be expected to keep up with homework and reading assignment due dates through this process. In addition, please review the syllabus to familiarize yourself with the structure and content of the course. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, in this first lecture, I will be briefly talking about the way data is generated and utilized in our modern world to connect us and bring clarity to issues at the population level that would otherwise be a mystery. We'll talk about how data drives the world we live in, how health professionals use those data to ensure population health, and how biostatistics contribute to the health sciences. We will also go over data management software we will see throughout the course. Today, we are creating data at a rate that is not only unprecedented, but is not even comparable to past decades or centuries. The way we live our lives now is inextricably connected to the data we produce and interact with on a daily basis. This provides us with an opportunity to study human behavior in ways never possible before. To do that, we need strong methods for gathering and summarizing data, as well as rigorous methods for modeling trends to predict future outcomes and identify influences within systems. Let's look at some of the ways these data are generated. The figure here lays out what I would call the anatomy of our data ecosystem. Most of this, I'm sure it resonates with you from movie and television streaming to Instagram photo submissions to Google searches. One thing I wanted to highlight because we can watch it change in real time is the number of Google searches occurring every minute in the world. You can see that it just ticks along without interruption. We are all connected to the internet in some way, and if we want to answer a question, we have access to the whole of human knowledge and history tucked neatly into our pockets. Just look at it go. It can be a lot to take in, but it should be obvious that methods for understanding and tracking all these data are essential and become more so as time goes on. What we're looking at here is what's referred to as big data. Health data are also being captured continually throughout our lives. Our individual health data are captured by medical professionals when we visit the doctor. Everything is entered into our electronic medical records and used by health systems to conduct medical research and quality improvement. On the public health side of things, which is where we focus for this course, there are hundreds of population and community level surveys conducted each year. The turnaround for these types of data is quite a bit slower than those captured by your phone or medical provider. They are usually based on complex sampling methods that require extensive work to get data into shape for analysis. This work is referred to as data cleaning. It's the process of mitigating potential errors in data collection as well as recoding variables so that they can be used for summary and analysis. Listed here are some examples that are commonly used for research in public health. You can click the links in the slide to navigate to where they are housed. So yes, biostatistics and data work are applied to every aspect of public health. The wheel here represents the 10 essential services of public health. Data management and analysis are important to the work within each of these services. Let's talk about The Matrix. This is a movie from the 90s about evil machines and virtual reality and Keanu Reeves. If you haven't seen it, let me give you a quick rundown. There once was a guy who was super bored with his life. Through some tricky and confusing circumstances, he met a super cool guy. He had a leather coat, tiny sunglasses, you get it. This guy told the bored man he wasn't actually bored in his life because his life was made up by evil machines. He told the bored man he was actually asleep in a weird goo tube along with the rest of humanity so the machines could use their body heat as a power source. The bored man was a battery. The cool guy told the bored man that the machines installed an HDMI port in the back of his head and projected his life onto his brain. This was the matrix. 
a world made up by machines to keep humans asleep and happy. This scared the bored man. The cool guy then offered the bored man two different pills. The red one would make him wake up and the blue one would let him just stay asleep. He chose the red pill and woke up. Then he learned Kung Fu. One day the bored man talked to a bald fella about the matrix who explained that the matrix was a jumble of data points that he could interpret. Looking at it, the bald fella could see patterns that he used to summarize and predict people's lives and behaviors. In our interpretation of the movie, the bald fella was our biostatistician. He had trained himself to make sense of the data. In other interpretations, he was a jerk that betrayed his friends and all of humanity, but that's not the point. The bored man eventually learned how to see patterns in the matrix and he became super cool. Also, he could stop bullets and fly. In a real sense, this is what we are doing when we apply biostatistics to the data around us. We can see the patterns and begin to do things that we would otherwise not be able to do. In the health sciences, this means being able to help people be healthy and save lives. Our charge as biostatisticians and public health professionals in general is to work to understand the lives and behavior of our community. We use rigorous methods developed over decades to take representative samples of the population and create order. We report out so that others can benefit from our work and life can improve for all. Let's go through an example from some of my work this last year. The ETSU Addiction Science Center, which is directed by Dr. Rob Pack, who is also Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here in the college and a full professor in the Department of Community and Behavioral Health, conducted some funded research back in 2013. One of the objectives of the research was to answer a question about how pharmacists communicate with their patients about opioid addiction and overdose prevention. The investigators decided to survey pharmacists in Tennessee, specifically community pharmacists. They mailed surveys to thousands of pharmacists and received 411 responses. This is actually pretty good. Once we had the data, we started examining them by first running descriptive analyses to see who responded to the survey. We had some questions in the survey that provided us with a picture of the person responding to the survey, their gender, race, type of pharmacy they worked at, and other characteristics. We wanted to get a sense for the distribution of our sample based on these characteristics. The figures here, which are bar graphs, quickly show us a snapshot of that sample. You can see we had more females than males and most respondents received their PharmD in the last 20 years. We then wanted to see if any of the, these characteristics were related to the pharmacist's communication intentions as well as their intent to co-dispense naloxone, which is an opioid overdose reversal drug. This bar graph is more complex, but if we look at the right side, we can see that most folks working at any of the pharmacy locations, which included chains, independent pharmacies, mass merchandise pharmacies, supermarkets, say they always communicate to their patients about risks associated with prescription opioids. Those working in mass merchandise locations were a little lower on that end of the graph. We also ran some quick bivariate statistical tests to look for preliminary significance in these effects. We'll explore those tests later in the course. We also, as a final step in the analysis, built some regression models to test for significant effects of pharmacist characteristics on their communication behavior. These models are a final step in testing researchers' hypotheses as they control for all factors of interest in the assessment of the relationship between their main predictor and the outcome. In the case of this study, we were interested in the pharmacist's attitudes and beliefs around addiction and how that affected their communication. Again, we will explore this process later in the course. On this project, I was responsible for cleaning and analyzing the data. Actually, I was not brought on to the team until after the sample had already been collected. This is often the case in research where statisticians are not brought on until data have already been collected. Research must have a biostatistician or someone on the team who can run statistics on the sample or nothing can be learned from the data. They brought the data to me and asked me to test their hypothesis, which I did to the best of the data's ability. A smart person who happened to be a statistician once said, to consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can perhaps say what the experiment died of. Biostatistics in some form is essential to every public health effort. 
even if it's just calculating averages and building bar graphs to represent the data. Here are some examples of how analytic methods benefit work in the health sciences. This semester, you will receive an overview of some basic data management and analytic methods. We'll go over these management methods, how to summarize data for reporting. You'll get an overview of sampling methods. You'll get some practice with data analysis using Excel and SPSS. You'll get an introduction to SAS. And overall, you will be prepared for the next course in which you're gonna dive deeper into these analytic methods. I expect we will have an interesting summer and I look forward to getting to know you all better.